So episode four of Portal PT Talks, we've got Zach Couples here, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, we're just going to be talking about all kinds of things today from what's a squat, what's a hinge, and stacking the rib cage or the pelvis, along with some research questions that I personally have had about breathing interventions. So we'll see how it goes, but enough of me talking. Zach, how you doing today, man? Just living the dream one day at a time, Kyle. You know me. There you go, man. Always. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more about Zach. I took, was the Seattle Cuban Matrix? That was your first one, correct? Yeah, the very first one. I'm sorry that's the one you took. Hey, no worries, it's, man. I it's look, improved a lot since then. I look at myself as the original OG, I guess. <laughs> you, you are about as old school as old school gets, Kyle. There it is, right? <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah. So I took Zach's course, uh, the human matrix when he first launched it. Uh, and it has been a huge game changer in my, the way I practice, the way I train, uh, both in physical therapy and, um, fitness training settings. Uh, I really like the model and we're definitely going to talk more about that. But like I said, enough about me or me talking, um, Zach, tell us about yourself your story, your specialties, um, where you come from, all that jazz. Well, I'll keep it somewhat ab abridged because my girlfriend listens to these and she's heard it a bunch of many times and she wants me to just get to the point. Um, so my story, um, I was a mediocre college athlete. I didn't want to be a mediocre college athlete. And I've always kind of been interested in movement and in fitness from – um, coaches I've had in high school. Uh, but the, to get to above mediocre, I needed to find other avenues besides running because I was a track and cross country guy. And so I got into the weight room, saw my performance significantly improved because I never really touched it before. And I ended up falling more in love with that than I did the running side of things. And so that led me to while I was an undergrad studying just a lot of different books and materials on how to get the most out of that. And then that got me into PT school, you know, in a roundabout way. And, uh, as I was in PT school, I was doing the same thing, just trying to study as much as I could on outside of class. And that's where I came across the name, Bill Hartman. I either read about him in men's health or, uh, or T nation, one of those two spots. He sounded like a smart guy, so I found a random old email of his on the internet, reached out to him, asked if I could uh, learn from him, and he was my CI or clinical instructor when I was in PT school for my ortho, and that kind of just set off the trajectory there. He got me really jazzed up about the profession and what, what, what it can all do, and I've spent the last eight, yeah, eight, years, eight years of practice just trying to help as many people as I can and become as good as I can. So I can advocate for my patients and clients. And, you know, that's involved taking way too many continuing education courses. Um, so I have a problem and, uh, <laughs> you know, spending time working in a lot of different settings, ranging from a chronic pain, pain place to the NBA to doing travel PT. And now I will be, um, doing two big things in terms of my, my job. The first thing is managing, ZachCouples.com and all the things that are affiliated with that. So that's offering online services, um, to teaching human matrix, as we alluded to before. And also I will be the lead physical therapist and education director at Elevate Sports Performance and Healthcare in wonderful Las Vegas, Nevada. Whenever the feds complete their background check on me, which, you know, <laughs> you know, being an OG like me, I, I appreciate them taking their time, making sure they iron out all the kinks on that oh yeah man the fingerprinting is not the best part of the licensure process it's ridiculous oh yeah i and i've had to do it a bazillion times because i have being a travel pt before mm -hmm. this um you know you gotta get a license in every state so the process is just as much headaches or even more so of a headache when you have to go get another license right it's a, it's how, a money making scheme oh yeah how many licenses do you hold well i don't i've had oh I you don't keep six. them going 
No, I've only kept a couple states going. Like any state I could see myself living in again, mm-hmm. I would keep it. But like Illinois, even that's where I'm from. Yeah. Um, I, I hope to never set foot there again unless it's to visit family. So that that license does not get kept. Right. I got you. I see that. Yeah. Well, so at least with I'm what I've been doing, um, I don't think I have mentioned uh, the portal PT is like a telehealth service. So I'm looking to kind of like Pokemon, got to catch them all, man. I want all my license. <laughs> so I'm going to be paying them good money here soon. Dang. Um, yeah, that's so. awesome though. That's, that's really cool that you're setting that up. Yeah. So I'm hoping I'll, I have my Washington. I got my Ohio. I'm going to go for Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee here soon. I'm just going to knock them out. Um, but well, you should look into the compact because yeah, that one helps out a lot, at least especially yeah, with, I, with Washington and Kentucky. They're already in the compact, so I'll be set there. But yeah, man. Perfect. Uh, in terms of so, you said you reached out to Bill Hartman. He's your CI. First off, that's awesome. Like that's pretty. I, I'm curious, how far along was he with like his sort of? Because, you know, he now has iFast, everything else um, that he's doing, marketing. How far along was he at that point in time? Was he still putting out quite a bit of content? No, he, he was, you know, the content that I saw from him was like a little bit on T-Nation. Um, he was doing a lot for men's health and his blog was not, there wasn't much going on there at the time. Mm-hmm. It was still BillHartman.net back then, so. Gotcha. Take that for what it's worth. Um, and he was, IFAST was there. I think I, IFAST was a couple of years old and he was working at, at the time, it was IU Health Occupational Services. So he was splitting time between the two jobs. And actually, like, that was a super rewarding experience because you got to work with really challenging patients. Not that he doesn't work with challenging patients now, but it's a different kind of challenge because mm-hmm. workers come. Um, so it, in, in, like, in terms of the model, he was, nowhere near where he is now it was very we we did some breathing stuff but it was very manual therapy based and you know fortunately bill and i have kept up our relationship and he's my dad after all (laughs) and it it was what i think was just as transformative for me if not more so is every time i'd go back and hang out with him um we would just spend time talking shop or I'd hang out with him while he's treating patients. And then I just see what he's doing now. And it's like, Oh wow. Okay. I see where you're taking this. And then I was able to bump it up another level. So it, it's incredibly important and useful to have some type of mentor in your life to, to have that because he, he saved me a lot of time um, in terms of making mistakes and you know, that's what mentorship's for. And I, you know, with my mentees or, the students that I've had or, or my course attendees, I'm trying to do the same for them. Mm-hmm. It's I've made these mistakes. I've taken way too many courses and that's allowed me to figure out what works, but also what doesn't work. And because I've separated those two things, I hopefully can save everyone who wants to learn from me time um, so they can help their patients and clients faster. Definitely. With looking at his information, like online at that time, like what is it that was really like you were drawn to, I guess, like was he doing a lot of like the, and I, for those listening that aren't familiar with human matrix and the model that you've kind of put together, um, which is that you've worked with Bill pretty closely with that, like setting up that type of model. Um, it's basically just a different positions, breathing. Um, I kind of think of it as like full body, PNF in some ways. Um, that's an accurate way to look at it for sure. Yeah, that's really how I try to describe it, especially to providers or trainers that aren't familiar with it. Um, but was he pro- like, were you guys, you said you're doing a little bit of breathing, but he wasn't like promoting this actively online eight years ago. Is that correct? Or No, not at all. Like I'd say in the last couple of years is when he's really, um, up the trajectory of what the model has become. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a combination of where I've, where I've taken it is taken a lot of what he's done. And he's, I mean, he's my biggest influence in my Mm -hmm. career and, and probably my life. Um, you know, I've taken a lot of the concepts I've learned from him and 
concepts in other fields. You know, I have to also give credit to like uh, my, my dear friend, Eric Otter, because a lot of the coaching stuff on day two yeah. is inspired from things I've learned from him. And, but it's like taking all of that information and other information that I've come across over the years and just figuring out what are the essentials? What, what are the, the important heuristics or not, not tricks, but like the, the simple rules or guidelines that you can follow that are going to maximize the outcomes of, of your clients. And I think if we understand that and we focus on the fundamentals and the basics, we're more often than not going to get better results than if we get too fancy too soon. Because I think that's, that's what happens when people attend seminars and they, and they don't have the mentorship and they're trying to figure this out on their own is like the rabbit hole in, in performance and health and really any discipline or sub-discipline of that can go very deep. And when you learn the deep stuff, that's really cool. And you experiment with it on yourself. You're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I can't wait to do this with my clients. And then you try it and, and it fails miserably. Mm -hmm. um, and so human matrix is really a, a call back to the basics and, and, and mastering those because more often than not, that's what our clients need because they're not movement professionals like us. Yeah. And they so can get, they can get a lot from the basics. It's just like, if you look at any beginner weight training study on, you know, hypertrophy strength or anything like that, I mean, you could throw peanut butter at beginners and they'll get better. So why, why use, you know, French contrast, on a beginner when you can get really far or why back squat a beginner when a goblet squat is going to get just as good adaptations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And that's, especially starting for myself, like in the fitness industry and then jumping into rehab, it was like, I, you know, you see all these guys on Instagram, they're doing wild, crazy things. And you just want to be like, that's what my client needs. I can kind of do that. Let's see if they can do it. Like, and you know, just like you said, mistake after mistake after mistake. And if anything, you know, kind of what you had mentioned earlier about being a mentor, like you're a mentor to your clients, you're saving them time with what they're doing. You're trying to get them from point A to point B as fast as possible with as little hiccups as possible. Um, so I think that's a interesting, well, it's not going to segue as well into the next question, but at least with what I'd like to kind of get into is, you know, you're doing these breathing interventions, you're trying these things out. Um, it's eight years ago, you're meeting with Bill, you have this great mentor. When was your like, aha moment when you're like, this is the rabbit hole, I'm going to jump down. And this seems to be the most effective way for me to help my patients and clientele out. And that being kind of what made human matrix what it is today well i think i really saw the power of the breathing stuff that we do when i worked with a guy on my clinical i remember this guy he's a tall tall guy and he well, i wouldn't say it was slender by any means but he wasn't obese he was just a big dude mm -hmm. and had low back pain and we did like several different soft tissue releases and it like got better but it wasn't all the way good and i just did a simple manual breathing technique and after he was done with that i was able to touch his toes completely pain free i thought oh that's pretty cool and i remember <laughs> i was writing my note on how the treatment went and i gave it to bill and and bill comes to me and i was i was a very timid shy quiet guy if you can believe that back then and he goes to my note and he and he shows me he goes is this right like very stern face is this right that's my bill impression for those who don't know which is very good despite if he says otherwise like i probably have the best bill hartman impression <laughs> in the industry um and i go uh yeah yeah and it was right that like the breathing mm -hmm. got the biggest changes and he's like how cool is that i said you know what bill that is pretty damn cool and it was that moment that I knew I needed to dive more into this information. And, and that took me, you know, through a lot of different breathing based courses, experimenting on, on my own a little bit, learning more from Bill as he advanced the model, taking some time to learn myself in terms of how breathing mechanics and all that worked. And it was um, the host of Seattle, um, Mike Lee, 
mm-hmm. who said, I want you to teach what you do. And it's like, oh, wow, I've never really looked at putting what I do into a model of some sorts. And, and that's really what started uh, Human Matrix was someone wanted to learn what I had to say. And that, that gave me impetus to try to condense that into a model. And then it's, it's morphed over time based on the feedback of attendees like yourself in terms of what works and what doesn't and how I can better teach it. Uh, because I think that's, it's one thing to present someone with a bunch of information. It's another thing to try to help them learn the information so they can apply it on Monday. And that's really been the focus because I think in our industry, we're not taught how to educate. That includes patients, that includes other practitioners. And that's something that, you know, and fortunately I know, you know, Levi, he's, he's an excellent teacher and and my girlfriend, Lucy, they've kind of tried to instill that into me um, to, to try to be a better teacher. There's, there's some aspects that I, naturally know or that like worked for me because I, I taught myself a lot of this um, but I think that's that's where I'm trying to differentiate myself and I think that's in order for us to to really make all the stuff that we know from a health and performance model applicable we have to figure out how to be better teachers and uh, human matrix is is my attempt at doing that right and at least I mean with some of the seminars I've taken, I can definitely see that. And at least looking at it from, I mean, bird's eye view, the concepts you're teaching, you know, the basics of these movement practices, um, stacking the ribs, you know, back pocket tuck, things that, things that just aren't utilized. I, I don't know. I, they're basic stuff. And like you said, we just want to jump right off the table, get into bigger, more conditioning type exercises at least in treatment aspects well even in fitness aspects as well you know you do your warm-up okay load it up let's go (laughs) Uh, but at least with this model that you put together and what would you say is like the most important aspect of it like other than the education part like, give me something that's a little more applicable, I guess, to a listener that's on here right now, or maybe an example of what this is like. So you said the manual technique that got someone to touch their toes. Maybe try to help describe what this process is and throw a little, sprinkle a little science on top. How's that sound? <laughs> sure. I could do a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, so I think the the fundamental concept that I want people to apply by the end of my class is the stack. Because if you can get that, that's probably going to get you 75% of the way there with most people. The stack is what I would, it, it is the stack is being able to place the thoracic diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm atop one another. Most individuals, if they present with movement limitations in various parts of their body, will not be able to do that. And I'm trying to teach or to do two things, well, several things. I'm trying to teach people some of the biomechanical concepts that lead to the inability to stack, which is where a lot of the didactic stuff comes into play. I'm teaching people how to assess if, if, the person in front of them has the ability to stack. And then I'm trying to teach them how to use exercise, both at low intensities and high intensities to be able to achieve the stack and then maintain that. Because what that allows you to do when you have that is you can create multi-directional pressurization within the ventral cavity, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. If you have that ability to pressurize every time you breathe in and breathe out, that gives you the potential to have all of the available movement present in those areas. Because if there are movement limitations present, chances are you probably don't have that ability uh, because there's, there's changes that occur within the, the skeleton and its relationship to the rib cage that lead to an inability to stack. So coaching the stack, is simply, it's not, I mean, it's simple, but it's not always easy to execute, mm-hmm. is making sure individuals can create a posterior pelvic tilt and then complete a normal respiratory cycle uh, without having any 
accessory activity or minimal accessory activity occurring. Um, so, you know, when you breathe in, you should have expansion of both the abdomen and the thorax in all directions. Most people either lift the rib cage up or they just belly breathe, which is not what we would consider normal respiratory mechanics. Those would be compensatory actions. The stack helps set the foundation for that to happen. Because now if I can create that multi-directional expansion in the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, well, now I increase the excursion of, of a lot of the tissues that attach to those areas. Well, well, guess what, Kyle? Most of your muscles of your shoulder and your scapula have an attachment on the thorax. Your abdominal muscles, those have attachments on the thorax and the pelvis. The muscles of your legs, they have several attachments on the pelvis. And so if you do not have full dynamic capabilities of those bones, which being able to teach an effective stack, i.e. restore the respiratory mechanism does, then that gives you at least the potential to be able to do that. Now, there are other things that you could get more complicated with in terms of restoring someone's movement capabilities. But if you spend an insane amount of time on that and you really get detailed and you really make sure that the person in front of you can create that, it solves more problems more often than not. And what I found is when people get too fancy and they say that, oh, Zach, you know, that breathing stuff doesn't work or Zach, I tried, you know, these activities and it just didn't seem to make an impact. More often than not is because that key piece was missing because it's not sexy but it needs to be mastered in order for you to, to progress to something more challenging. Right. You gotta, you gotta be able to play twinkle, twinkle little star before you go to stairway to heaven. If you know what I'm sizzling. Definitely. Yeah, no, I, that was perfect. I really liked all that. So you're essentially saying that we have to have rib cage pelvis sitting there in the stack and that helps us master internal pressures that then lead to better movement options outside of that kind of stack position. And within. And within. And within. Explain a little bit more on that. As in, or do you mean as in like the diaphragm moving or? I, well, I, it's not just the arms and legs. It would be the whole body. Yeah. Gotcha. That's what I mean by that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. I like it. Um, so in terms of, so you're looking at all this, we have the breathing aspects. Well, I'm gonna jump into a different question. Why isn't this type of information provided? You know, cause there's obviously, I mean, you're a smart guy, I know you read, where's the research and why isn't this covered in sort of literature that comes out, you know, like breathing intervention, something like that. Like I just did, a, or we just had an in-service at our clinic uh, on, what was it? Neck pain and the CPG. So clinical um, or clinic practice guidelines. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we covered it. It has some good stuff. Basically, the main thing from it was go exercise. That's going to fix all your problems. Obviously, it doesn't, it had nothing in there about, you know, it had mobs, it had manipulations, all these different things that can decrease pain, which I know pain is a different topic than movement variability. But why isn't this type of information provided or in the research, present in the research? You have to really dig for it. Well, I'm going to quote two people. So the first person I'm going to quote is Max Planck. And he said, science progresses one funeral at a time. And then the second person I'm going to quote is Bill and he says the right people in the APTA need to die. <laughs> so I I think it, like there the, the people who are in power have a preconceived notion about what physical therapy, what training, what all of our modalities are. And when they have that power and there's people who think differently, uh, that can be threatening because you have some degree of cognitive dissonance. And, and I think it goes, and now, you know, that being said, is there a lot of research that supports the interventions that I do? 
there's not necessarily a randomized controlled trial or systematic review of Zach's exercises are better than general exercises, whatever the hell that means. So in that sense, it's not evidence-based if that's what you're basing evidence off of. A lot of what I have to do is look at research, some of it being you know, review articles, some of it being anatomical studies, some of it being biomechanical studies, seeing what those have to say, and then attempting to look through it from the lens at which I think, which is, of course, biased. And so from a from taking where I'm at with things to applying that to textbooks or even clinical practice guidelines, from their standpoint, they have to kind of cover their butts from a legal standpoint in terms of what's most effective, I think. And not only that, but as, as a practitioner or as a coach in those textbooks, you have to learn a lot of the basics like anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and all that. And it's a lot to cover. Do I think it could be taught better? And I think, do I think relationships between various body regions could be covered better? Absolutely. But um, I, I just think, I, th I think sa sadly we're still several steps away from making this like a standard practice. And even when there's cool findings in the research, which you can see that depending on what you're looking at, for it to be a standard of care, that usually takes, I think, 17 to 20 years. Gotcha. So if, if your M, if some MD research comes out today, or a good example of that, not in our field, is uh, stents, right? The New New England, I think it was New England Journal of Medicine, or one of the big medical journals, basically showed that stents are not a useful treatment for cardiovascular disease unless there's an, you know, an immediate blockage that if you don't fix this, it would be death. But there's still a lot of people doing stents out there. Yeah. Well. Even like the hips, you know, total hip, still people going in posterior when there's clear research saying that anterior approach is way better, less invasive, like easier rehab. So it's, I don't know, it's interesting because, you know, I try to talk to a lot of people about these approaches. I know in my clinic, luckily where I work, they're very open minded. They're like, hey, as long as you're getting results, do your thing. Like if people are happy, you know, if you're not hurting anybody, <laughs> by all means do it. Um, but even trying to talk to some, and even previous coworkers, I try some things, I show them some things and they're like, well, where's the research? But like nothing supports this kind of stuff. And, you know, I'll show them just some con ed stuff or things that you've linked to, you know, they might, They'll probably read the abstract, but <laughs> if that, and then they just go on with their day, even though when I do my test retest or table tests, or even just, you know, how low can you squat these different types of tests, I'm getting significant changes in how this person's moving from just two rounds of breathing. That's truly incredible. Like I had a guy the other day, he limited with right rotation, thoracic rotation. I had him do it, like, it wasn't even pretty. <laughs> it was just put them there, as you say, make them struggle. Put them there in a external rotation a little bit, quadruped, had them breathe three times, two sets of three. He got up and phew, cleared all the way. He's hitting like 90. And I was like, no one saw that. Dang it. Like, I, why didn't anyone see this? Like, oh, man. So it's, well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, even when you look at something like a clinical practice guideline, uh, there, nothing in our field is grade A evidence. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. So to, to pull the EBP card in terms of looking at a randomized controlled trial, that's well done let alone a systematic review, I think is completely misguided. And the nice thing about the movement profession is, I think there's a difference with that profession versus medical professions in terms of how much we need to rely on the highest level of evidence. A breathing exercise isn't gonna kill anyone. Right. But the wrong medication will. 
Definitely. So <laughs> I, I think our field is young enough that we still have a lot of exploring and tinkering that we can do. And fortunately, assuming you know contraindications to exercise and everything, I, I think we're still at a stage where trial and error is a valuable use of the scientific method. And you know, you, you doing what you did with your guy, that's, that's evidence-based practice in my eyes, because you just, you just did an experiment. Right. Well, and it's you used ob objective testing. To, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Objective testing, and then also just knowing how the biomechanics work. You know, there are, this is how, this is evidence of how the human body works, what happens with upward, downward rotation of the scapula and how the spine and respiratory processes happen. So, you know, I've had these conversations with folks and they're like, well, there's no research, there's no research. And it's like, this is anatomy, this is physiology, this is here. Like, I don't know how else, what else you want me to do? You got to try it out yourself at this point. So, but I think that is another, this one, this question actually segues in. Uh, so something that you also talk about and I've seen has been really pushed on social media lately. I love it. Um, is the what's a hinge, what's a true squat. And I think it's disrupting quite a few people um, out there in mainstream, you know, um, fitness, physical therapy. And I'm curious to hear like some of the research that you've come across for this true like knees forward, true, that's a true squat versus our, our hinge patterns. Um, could you provide some like an overview of that concept and kind of what you think about it. Yeah. The big difference is what direction is the pelvis traveling? So with a squat that ought to involve more vertical displacement of the pelvis. So the pelvis should move more straight up and down with a hinge. You should have more posterior displacement, the pelvis moving backward and then coming back to the start position. So you can do whatever exercises you want, but those are two different extremes. The mechanics are different in both of those situations. With the squat, as I've defined it, you're gonna have more sacral counter nutation, which would be the sacrum tipping backwards. And that changes the length tension relationships in the pelvic floor to allow your only option movement wise to be downward. The hinge, on the other hand, would involve more sacral nutation or sacral flexion, which changes the pelvic floor length tension relationships to allow the movement to occur more posteriorly. And that's really the big difference between these two things. Neither is good or bad. What I'm advocating for, and this is true with, with all training, is you ought to be able to demonstrate your ability to perform several different movements first, AKA be a movement generalist, before you go to specialize into something. To, to take this to more of a broad scope problem, maybe within the world, is there seems to be a big push for um, not specializing in sports, in a particular sport as a kid, um, or at least in our field, that's something we advocate for. We want kids to be athletes and be involved in many different activities mm -hmm. to um, be healthier, have a, have a longer career before they go and specialize into one sport. I would argue we have to, we ought to do the same thing in the weight room. And that involves an understanding of what the body's capabilities are and creating clear delineations of exercises. Because if your lower body stuff involves deadlifting and back squats well guess what you're more likely doing more hinging patterns than you are a true squat pattern and a hinge pattern um, so that's that's really what it's all about um, you know in, in terms of things that are controversial about it as i think that makes me think or i think that makes a lot of people think that i'm saying we need to get rid of back squats or hingy squats are bad or anything like that and and that's not what i'm saying at all uh, power Power lifters have to have that type of squat if they want to be great at their, at their craft, especially with gear. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, I, I just want to make a clear delineation of that and, and realize, too, that if you know, 
powerlifting involves certain adaptations that have to occur within the body, just as gymnastics would. Yeah. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I think as movement professionals with the clients that we're working with it, especially if most of us work with gen pop, it would behoove us to give them a, a general movement foundation, which would be doing everything that, that the human body should be able to do. And, and that's, that's really what the controversial thing is about. Right. Well, and it, it, with everything you teach too, I, you're teaching movement options um, should be present for, they should be able to do both. Essentially. You should be able to squat and you should be able to hinge. And you know, if they can't, it's not a problem. You know, say someone can't truly squat. It's not a problem until it's a problem, I guess. Um, but really it's, for someone to be a generalist, they should be able to do it all, essentially. And I think that's, you know, I like Pat Davidson, what he said, or he had a post a while back, just to paraphrase it, it was, you know, you have a Ferrari and a Honda Civic, you know, you're, not, you're never, no matter what you do, that Honda Civic still never going to be as fast as that Ferrari, no matter how much you soup it up, which I don't know, someone probably out there maybe has done something, but. <laughs> I saw Fast and the Furious, I know what they're capable of. <laughs> Oh, you know, you got Vin Diesel out there lifting helicopters and stuff. <laughs> um, exactly. But in terms of, and I guess something too that is always, and this is a personal question, but, or personal experience of mine, when I talk to people about movement options and, you know, they should be able to do, say, both a squat with the specific mutations and a hinge you know, it doesn't really, we're creating better movement options, but this isn't here to solve pain necessarily. Would you agree with that? Mm, I, well, the, the problem with pain is it's incredibly complex. It can have an influence on pain and, and injury. Um, you know, well, I, if, I guess like right off the bat, you know, I do a manual technique. I can do some traction and someone's or a distraction and their ridiculous symptoms decrease. That's immediate. But if I do, depending, I don't know, maybe what, what's your experience? I, I mean, more often than not within a session, I will get a significant change in symptoms. Really? People more often than not. Well, what did you do with attraction? You created some space within the joint in theory, or space within probably a lot of the tissues, you know, mm -hmm. it's really hard to say what the hell we're doing. Well, could, could an exercise do the same thing? If I have a, I'll give you an example. Let's, let's use the elbow because the elbow is always a good example. Let's say I have increased bicep tension that's limiting my elbow extension. Well, on the front side of the joint, there's going to be reduced joint space just because the bicep is contracting on that side and there ought to be in theory more joint space on the back side. Well, if you, you could perform a traction technique to increase the joint space and maybe that relieves some things, relieves some pressure on the joint. Well, another way I could do that is try to shift the fluid with a contraction. So if I contract the triceps really hard, that may cause the synovial fluid to be pushed more anteriorly, increasing the joint space. And so you elicited the same effect as you would have with a manual technique. I really think all of these interventions that we do are probably acting under a similar mechanism. So, you know, when I'm working with someone, I, I care about their pain and I care about where it is, but I really don't, Kyle. <laughs> like it's... It, it, I want, I want to improve if I, more often than not, if you can improve the available joint range ranges of motion at all of the respective joints, that's going to do a lot of things. I think, I think that one may increase space within the tissues. It may minimize any tissue ischemia that's present because if I hold any position for an extended period of time, that's going to reduce blood flow. So if you change the contractile properties of tissue, that could potentially increase blood flow. And if you have access to more movement, 
that ought to even out the workload distribution throughout the body or at least change it. And the combination of those factors could have a positive impact on the amount of nociception that's being produced in a specific tissue. So I don't, like, I don't see any difference. The, the only thing that might be different or when I think a manual technique is, is useful, and they're useful, this is not me discrediting manual technique because I think it works under the same mechanism, is if that person can't recreate the, the internal environment on their own. So your person who has radicular symptoms, maybe they don't move well and they can't create that same distraction that you can do manually because they just can't get their body into that position. You could use a manual technique to recreate that sensation that they need and then reinforce that with an, an activity that attempts to replicate the same thing. Gotcha. That made, okay, crystal clear. No, that was a great, yeah, I really, that was a good answer. Okay, so you're looking at it as it's all the same mechanisms. The body's doing its thing. We're pushing fluid around, and it's still, yeah, I never actually considered like manual therapy being like that. I've always kind of looked at it from more of a neuro standpoint, I guess, um, which it is. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, but that's also the only thing that they've measured. Yeah. You know, if you look at the immune influences of manual therapy, and that's all that you look at, like in terms of social grooming and things like that, you're going to think it's all immune system. It's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. Like any intervention is going to have some impact on all of the systems. And that's the key thing to consider. Like that's one thing that I you know, have in, in some of my pre-reading in the seminars talking about the super system and interconnectivity of all systems. It's like mm -hmm. the research when I, when I was first getting into uh, the con ed realm of PT and you can, you could see, you know, it was a great example of this is the Noy group, the where David Butler's group, uh, their class was initially a mobilization of the nervous system. Now it's mobilization of the neuroimmune system. And there's research out there saying it's the neuroimmune endocrine system. And it's like we just keep adding these systems when we have to realize that all systems work, to, like we're working with one system and we only break the systems down because it's easier for us to understand and conceptualize that way. Right. And you can't, I, I was listening to the Rebel Performance podcast and he was literally talking about the same thing, you know, looking at it from a physiological or a um, physiology standpoint and energy systems and it's like everything is just over top of each other the whole time you can't get a specific one pure i mean it's kind of like elements or something out there everything's always working together and it's always going to be meshed together and i think as providers as trainers stepping back and just looking at it like that like bird's eye view like hey this is still this is a complex organism human being that is constantly changing morphing and really in my opinion problems occur when that organism is unable to change and adapt to its environment and that's when things go awry potentially pain potentially stiffness whatever it is that's going on or lack of movement options so i think yeah it makes me, I really want to take your course again, just to like hear you talk about it and see all the updates. Um, but I'd be happy to have you, Kyle. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, but I think that also kind of goes into, you know, we're looking at the system as a whole, but what have you really been focusing on recently that you think may have people need to maybe focus on a little bit more that is in this, you know, hodgepodge that we are human beings but yeah what have you been what's been kind of like improving your practice or do you think people should know about probably the biggest thing that i've been focusing on a lot more and changing is myofunctional therapy and sleep so for those who don't know what that is myofunctional therapy is basically it, it involves being able to manipulate and move your tongue effectively. But I think it's a lot more than that. I, I think it's restoring the 
the, the movement options available in the upper airway. And that involves retraining tongue postures. That involves teaching things like chewing, swallowing, and nasal breathing. Because um, what I've been finding a lot, and it's probably because I'm looking for it now, is no one really sleeps well. And uh, one contributing factor of that, aside from a lot of the modern technologies and all that, may be um, the way our faces are changing based on what the modern diet is doing, lack of breastfeeding, um, you know, eating soft foods as a kid, lots of different things. And there's, there's genetic factors at play. But the, the bony structure is morphing in a manner that is not desirable for the upper airway, i.e. nasal breathing and all of that. Like our airways are getting smaller. And you see things like crowded teeth and, and things of those nature. Well, those factors may negatively impact your ability to breathe through your nose. Because now if, if facial dimensions have reduced, but the tongue size hasn't changed, well, now you don't have room necessarily for your, your tongue to create a seal to prevent air from going into your mouth, thus forcing it through your nose instead, which is, which is what, what myofunctional therapy is basically trying to get people to do. So a lot of what I've been finding is I've been doing a really good job at improving someone's airway, airway mechanics from C7 and below, but I haven't found something that's useful above C7. And I think this, this in, in combination with a lot of the other disciplines that would be involved with improving someone's upper airway is, is, has been a, a, a really big um, game changer for myself and my clients. I've had a lot of people come refer to me with, with sleep issues and just doing a few simple tongue exercises have, have led to some pretty significant changes. I have a little girl who I'm working with right now who she, she's had a history of trauma and she's, um, she is a really bad mouth breather had like bottle rot. Um, so it was bottle fed, not breastfed mm -hmm. and was, you know, had a history of bedwetting, tons of nightmares, waking up frequently throughout the night, like dark circles, things you just shouldn't see in a, in a kid. Mm -hmm. And by just focusing on some simple tongue exercises and teaching her not only how to place her tongue up on the roof of her mouth, but to perform certain actions with her tongue and swallowing, almost all of that significantly reduced. She's only had like one nightmare in the last three weeks. Um, is breathing through her nose while she's sleeping. Uh, no bedwetting. I mean, it's just been remarkable changes. And, you know, that being said, I also don't think it's the show because the last session that we did, I ended up doing absolutely nothing with the tongue. And that got some profound changes from a movement standpoint, not just in her neck, but her jaw. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, but I, that being said, I think it's another piece of the puzzle that we, we really are neglecting, but I think is really important. Yeah. Well, and just breathing in general is, it's taken for granted, I believe. And it's influences so much. And I don't, I'm really, I'm curious as to why, you know, I think Pilates does a decent job of promoting, you know, breathing and how it works and the importance of it, but it still doesn't have, you know, we're only just now starting to truly understand like how important it is. Um, but I'm curious, like how in the future it will change, but just being able to change some of these, just so air can get in better, how that can affect someone's emotional state, how they sleep at night that's crazy um do you adv advocate for because you know there's like the oxygen advantage um i've read that do you advocate for like the taping of the mouth at night yeah yeah and it's something i was kind of i, I poo-pooed initially because i'm like well why don't we just ask ourselves why is that person mouth breathing when they sleep um but having done some coursework, and I actually plan on taking a course with Patrick McEwen, hopefully this year. Um, and um, I've done some lip taping for myself and some clients and got some pretty good results. And hashtag it's evidence-based, what you gonna do about it. There's a study done, um, and I can find the link to it, but they looked at sleep studies 
And one of the, the big markers to tell if you have sleep apnea is measuring the AHI, which I believe is, it's ap, apnea something index. Um, yeah, I don't know what the H stands for, but um, higher is, is better. So you want golf rules with this. You want to get lower AHIs. So because like one would be an apneic event, like if you had a 1.0, you'd have one 10 second period where you're not getting any breathing per hour. So like on the high end, some of you may have 40 and that would be considered severe. Uh, which, yeah, that's scary. That's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they took people with mild sleep apnea, which I believe is five to 15. And by just applying the lip tape, they were able to knock that number down by, I think on average four or five points. Wow. So I think it's definitely really useful. Mm -hmm. But you also have to look into, does that person have the ability to breathe through their nose? And are you dealing with a structural issue or a functional issue? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can lip tape till you're blue in the face and teach malfunctional therapy. But if someone's got a septal deviation or they have really bad enlarged turbinates or they have um, uh, allergies, like you're, you're not going to get that better. And that's why you have to refer to someone like an ENT to look at myself, I've had the surgeries. Mm -hmm. Like I had a septoplasty and I had a turbinate reduction. And once I had that, my resting heart rate dropped 10 beats per minute within two weeks, it's which crazy. is insane, right? And it mm -hmm. wasn't a cardiac output problem. <laughs> yeah, right. It's just kind of like a, I guess, would you look at it as more like just a stress, like an external, I don't, I don't even know. Like, well, it's probably the biggest stressor that, a human's going to face right it's like you think about all the things you need to survive you can't survive very long if you don't have oxygen right and you see your body's going to do anything it can to get that back right or to get that and that's going to impact everything you know you mentioned sleep but how about uh, exercise endurance um if your if your tissues aren't getting adequate oxygen they're going to you know, fall into lactate metabolism a lot faster and, and fatigue. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I can only speak to, to myself, but like I, I'm working with an ENT again right now and he gave me some hardcore drugs to snort up my nose, but not the party stuff that y'all might be thinking <laughs> of that actually, which by the way, little side tangent, cocaine, terrible for the nasal health. <laughs> like can cause septal perforation and then you're screwed happened to the one lady from um um what's the band fleetwood mac what was her name stevie nicks yeah yeah <laughs> did a lot of coke messed up her nose she had to get it all repaired and stuff like that so Jeez. public service announcement cocaine is a hell of a drug don't do it <laughs> um, but i'm on these these corticosteroids for my nose and like within minutes of doing the first dose like i felt an immediate difference breathing was quieter and the cool thing was like my extra exercise tolerance was low super low in terms of if i was weight training i couldn't really complete that many sets and when i was fatigued like as soon as i hit the last set like i was done i couldn't grind or anything like that and you know within just a couple of weeks i've seen significant changes in the amount of sets i've been able to do and and things of that nature Nice. Um, you know, and I've, I've had a couple of clients too, who doing some of these things to encourage nasal breathing have seen similar, similar changes. So it's, it's a really important thing to focus on. Right. You know, well, not just from an exercise standpoint too, but from sleep as well. You know, yeah. if you have sleep apnea, you, and it, you, it's undiagnosed and untreated, it will, it can reduce your lifespan by up to 20%. Yeah. Super important. Well, hey, I mean, think too, like if you had this sort of the knowledge that you do now back in college, running track and field and all that, like who knows? <laughs> Bro, we, you know, I wouldn't be on this podcast. I'd be yeah, you man, know, right? Olympic gold medalist or something. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the body. I don't have the body for it. But hey, man. But yeah, I, I always think about that. It's regrets. Regrets. Right. Well, it's what you could have known. I'm curious. Yeah. So in something I noticed too, so I've actually done the mouth taping while sleeping. I did it for a full month. I was like, I'm going to try this out in the first two weeks. This is just my experience, but I had the craziest dreams I've ever had in my life. I 
like I have no idea. Like I had dreams about and like vivid, vivid, vivid <laughs> dreams about like wolves. And like, I was watching some like zombie show and it stuck with me through that whole time. And I had like zombie dreams. I don't even know, man. But it, it was crazy that nothing else had changed except for me just taping my mouth and cognitively I'm having all these different experiences. I'm curious, like, did you, have you had anything like that with, since you've had all this work? So it, dreaming is always been a challenge. Well, not always, but as I've gotten older, I've had a harder time remembering dreams. Well, that's a and sign of, interest- isn't that a sign of like good sleep, correct? Dreams, yeah. So funny you say that. I got a sleep study done and I use the watch pad, which is a at-home one. And so I, I don't have sleep apnea, but I have this thing called upper airway resistance syndrome where you have like apneic events, but they're less than 10 seconds. So they have another measure. I think it's the RDI. Um, I, I can't, I think it's res, res, respiratory distress index, I think is what it stands for. Don't quote me on that though. Um, and it was interesting. So the sleep study can tell when you're in sleep or uh, light sleep, deep sleep and REM. And when I'm in REM, I actually have mild sleep apnea, just in REM, mild sleep apnea. And I have way more, so I have a higher AHI, I think I had like 12. And then my RDI was also fairly high and I don't dream. Um, so, uh, you know, I've tried the taping. I've, I have been dreaming more, but it's really light. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm going into other treatments to see if I can improve that as well. Um, but I haven't had like a, this huge dramatic experience. I would say qualitatively. And then I use Aura Ring to track um, my sleep for whatever that's worth. Um, I've been able to get more hours, which is, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, that's since I've done the lip taping. Yeah. Definitely. Have you noticed any like changes in like facial, like musculature or like, I don't know. I'm just curious. Like tension and stuff? tension or like before and after photos like if there's any like differences in like nasal breathing and like changes in just facial hypertrophy maybe i don't know if that's what you would there's call tons it. Of, if you look on the internet there's tons of cases showing differences in facial structure and mm-hmm. if you look at my face i have this really cool picture of my side profile this would have been probably 20 12 uh, maybe it was when i was in pt school or just right after um if you look at that now versus or then versus now and my face has changed pretty dramatically and i've had a, a quite a few different things done no plastic surgery or anything like that <laughs> but um yeah i mean this stuff can definitely change yeah. i've had some clients where they've gotten you know not not like a drastic amount but you can change millimeters in terms of the uh, dental arch and, and things of that with something like my my functional therapy Personally, I have I don't really have like facial tension. The only place I really have tension is my neck, mm. um, which I'll get if I'm eating dinner and I got to look to my left. But uh, I haven't. It's been a while since I've gone to dinner, and I usually put people on my right side. So uh, <laughs> I'll have to test it out and get back to you, Kyle. Right. No, because I've actually noticed since because I've worked with some PRI specialists in the past, and like just going through, I probably like at least the last two to three years since like performing breathing work and nasal breathing like I have some photos where it's just like completely different like I don't know just like more full I don't know it's weird just look you'll look different (laughs) when you put side by side photos up and I don't know maybe that's with age who knows but um, well but you could there's things you can measure too Um, yeah and like I've definitely seen people get some facial changes uh, like you you can get changes within posture so why wouldn't you be right. able to change things of, of, of the face as well Definitely. bone can adapt especially in children can i can imagine in like a peed setting like oh my goodness but yeah that's where uh, you really got to catch kids yeah that's what i that's so i that's funny you say that so i was actually talking to katie st Clair about that and that's something i'm hoping within the next 10 years i really want to try to get into more proactive care and just really trying to like catch this kind of stuff, education based, like, I don't even know what kind of business it would be, but really just how we can prevent a lot of this stuff that like maybe you and I have experienced 
you know, like all like, like I've had hip pain, all these different types of things. And it'd be interesting to try to like prevent that and what we can do as, you know, society as providers and in physical therapy and fitness realm. But I don't know if that was a tangent, but <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, it's an essential thing, especially yeah. with the way the health of our current population is going. We, I mean, we have, I think the next generation of kids are anticipate it's anticipated that they're not going to outlive their um, parents. Yeah. My generation my, yeah. gen is right there. So hey, hopefully yeah. I'm, Hopefully I beat them. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I hope me. so too, man. They, they are. Well, you know what? Uh, Tupac has a great song about that called Against All Odds. So there you go. I know. Listen to that and that will inspire you. <laughs> hey, we got a edited version on our clinic playlist that we <laughs> That's play. awesome. Yeah, we got all kinds. I, I have to send you my clinic playlist. It's pretty good. But uh, all right. Good. So I know we're running out of a little bit of time. I've got a couple off the cuff questions I want to ask you. We'll fire through them real quick. Um, they're just kind of like the last three questions. You're actually the first person I've changed some of them up on, but um, I feel honored. Yeah, right. Hey, I have to for you. You know, I gotta make sure all the questions are there and ready for you. <laughs> Appreciate um, you, dog. So, first one: What is the worst fitness advice you have ever been given? Fitness or rehab advice, we'll say. Um, yeah, since you either at the beginning, now, whatever it is. Let me hear it. That's wrong. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so I, in track and cross country, both in high school and college, I, I mean, I'm just kind of an obsessive person in that regard. Like in high school, I was reading like these running textbooks that had all this physiology and stuff that I didn't understand. And I would read things of like, I remember Sebastian Coe, who was one of like the greatest 800 meter runners of all time, Olympic champion, I think he was Olympic champion. Um, and I would like question what my coaches were doing because, well, you know, the greatest 800 meter athlete out there, he, he didn't do that stuff. Why are we, why are you running me into the ground? And so I, they'd, they'd get mad and they'd say that's wrong. Or like, um, I remember my coach in college, um, who's, you know, a highly lauded uh, track and cross country coach in division three. Um, I, I read something that if, if your heart rate's really high, you should drop to the ground and it will help with recovery and decrease your heart rate faster. And he said, that's wrong. I, I don't believe that. Well, then guess what happened? There's a, there was a study done that I read a few years ago about the recovery position uh, in terms of if you put, if it's better to recover with your arms above your head or if it's better to recover folded over with your hands on your knees. And the heart rate drops significantly faster if you put your hands on your knees. And it's even better if you drop into a full squat. Not, not it's not in the research, I would say that's anecdotally, but yeah. you know, I could probably put a research together study if people wanna throw a couple million big Z's way. <laughs> Um, so when someone tells you you're wrong because they have, you know, the, the, the years of experience on you and they don't take the, the time to understand and, and critically apply, appraise what you're saying and read the stuff for themselves. Um, that was the worst advice that I had ever gotten. And it's things like that that have pushed me to continue to learn, to continue to get better, and, and really to be skeptical of what most people say, or just about everyone. You just have that inquisitive mind. And it's not to say that what they're saying is wrong, but you need to develop that understanding to, to make sure you're getting uh, the information that's going to best help you from a fitness and, and rehab standpoint. So Definitely. No, I completely agree with that. I've heard that a lot from previous coaches, just a lot of, even just educators, you know, teachers, professors, it, it's almost, I'm curious why that is, is even a response. I don't know, maybe that's a generation kind of deal or if it's ego, ego, right. And if that's really the case, but I mean, we could go on a whole tangent of just coaching education system and how it is presented. Uh, Cause I can think of quite a few times, like I had a nutrition class 
and I asked similar questions about, you know, fats and all this. But, you know, it was around when keto was coming out. I'm like, well, why isn't that? And she's just like, nope, we're not covering that. You're wrong. Like, <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, well, it's not in the curriculum, I guess. But <laughs> so that's the big thing. Well, we won't jump down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, that's episode number 26 or something. Yeah, something like that. The education system. I'll bring you back on for that one. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, no, that's a fantastic, fantastic answer of the worst advice you've given ever been given. Um, let's go on to our next one. Uh, what was your first exercise experience ever, and was it good or bad? Um, well, so like I, I grew up playing sports as a kid. I played basketball, I did taekwondo and all that stuff. And I always enjoyed it, even though I was kind of an inside kid, because um, I played a lot of video games in my day too. It's not getting hey. twisted. Um, <laughs> but I think what really, um, what really got me excited about the field was was weightlifting, and what got me into that was I, I was lucky. I picked up the book Core Performance, which was out of Athletes Performance. They're now Exos, written by Mark Verstegen, mm -hmm. and, and like it was a pretty dang good program. And it was like very comprehensive. They had movement prep, they had plyometrics, they had strength training and like all of it was complimentary. They had energy systems development. I would do all of that stuff. And like just seeing the, the, the comprehensiveness of that approach was like really cool to me. Cause I felt like I was really doing everything I could to get better. And like, that was a phenomenal experience. And I mean, it, it really helped me, grow to love what what you and I do Kyle yeah definitely I played a lot of video games too so <laughs> and I actually ran track and cross country as well it's pretty funny nice yeah. what'd you run what was your event I was 110 hurdles and 400 nice yeah. okay okay so you got some wheels yeah I tried I ran cross country literally from fourth grade up till senior year but I I think I hated every single moment of it. <laughs> yeah. I just kept it's fun to run it. fast, not exactly run for long periods of time. I like beating people and then being able to look back immediately. Like, mm -hmm. did you see that? Like, yeah. but, um, let's go on to uh, our last one. What is your number one source for educational info, either rehab, fitness, or self development? Um, Gosh, this is going to be kind of a cop-out answer, but uh, PubMed. Okay. Well, and the reason why, I think if you rely on any one, so no one source has all the answers. And, you know, I say that having a blog that I want people to, to come to, but I don't have all the answers. And I think when you're, when you are faced with a problem, that's probably the best time to direct your learning in terms of solving that specific problem. And you should probably consume a wide variety of resources that are focused on fixing that problem as opposed to keeping up with one source and, um, you know, following them and reading their stuff on a weekly basis, because you might, you might check out my debrief this week and it's not applicable to you and you just watch it and then it goes by the wayside. But if you have a patient or a client who might benefit from the information that's on that debrief, then it's going to be a lot more meaningful. You'll get more out of it. You'll be able to apply it and your retention will be better. Mm -hmm. So I put PubMed because I think research is really important. I think it can be extremely informative um, to make a lot of decisions off of, and it can help enhance your understanding of a lot of basic um, anatomy, physiology, and, and biomechanical mechanisms from which you can build out your model. So we'll go with PubMed. I like it. Do you have a specific, do you use like an app or do you just use Google when you're checking out PubMed articles? I use Google, but I also, over the years, I've subscribed to a lot of different journals. Gotcha. So I have this thing actually, it might be over PubMed, which is, I call ZachMed which is my reading list folder on my Dropbox. And so I get all these subscriptions that come into my email on, on the daily and I read through. And if I see something that seems intriguing based on the title, I'll just go and download it and then save it to my folder. And then when 
the time comes, I have this question in mind that I want answered. I just go through my folder of stuff on that, put it all together. Then I skim through PubMed, find anything that's new and up to date. And then I go through all that stuff, read an abstract. Is this helpful? Yes. Then I go more in depth and critically appraise the article. If it's not, then I scrap it, throw it out. Um, and that's really been useful for me. And then you get, you know, textbooks or other books to help supplement that and help, help provide references for you to understand right. topics that might not be explained thoroughly in the, uh, in the paper. Yeah. That's a taking notes. I'm glad I have this recorder because I'm trying to set up something similar to that. That's a great <laughs> system process you got going on there. So. Kyle Med, baby. You got to get there Kyle go. Med going. Exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Well, last question. Where can we find out more about you? What are you doing next? And then we'll call it there. Yep. The, the best spot is uh, zackcouples.com. Um, that is my website. That's where you can sign up for Human Matrix. That's where you can, uh, you, you know, if you sign up for a newsletter, you get a ton of free stuff. Um, You'll get, uh, you know, I also have offer a lot of services on there. I offer online movement consultations. I offer mentoring. Um, so, you know, with movement consultations, if you're like, wow, this stuff sounds cool. I'm not moving as well as I'd like to. And I need someone's other eyes to do it. Or if you want to figure out how to do that with your people, movement consultations, mentorings there, I offer online training where I apply a lot of these concepts. And you know what, Kyle, just because I like you and your listeners, um, if you got someone listening to this and they would like to work with me, I'm going to offer them a 10% discount. I only got 20 of these available. Oh man. So you let me know that sis, just say Kyle sent me. That's the <laughs> discount code in the email. And uh, I'm going to hook your peeps up. There we so go. Um, I'm going to just throw that out there. But like zackcouples.com is probably the best place to find me. I'm also on all the social media stuff, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And uh, my YouTube channel is pretty big. Um, yeah. I think I have a thousand videos or something nuts. So like that's where uh, the debriefs have like my show notes and things like that are on my website, but you can also watch them on YouTube. And I got a gang of exercises on YouTube and I'm trying to go through and get a little bit more detailed in writing what they're for and categorizing them. Um, so yeah. That's, those are really the big places you can find me. And then, you know, hopefully in the next month, if you're in Las Vegas, you can come find me there at Elevate Sports Performance and Healthcare. I'll be on the one on Sunset, I think it's Sunset Avenue or Sunset Road. Sounds awesome. Dang, man. Well, hey, it sounds like big things are coming for you. Um, you're already doing huge things, actually. So I can't even say that. But I think, it'll, I think Las Vegas will treat you well. And I'm excited for you. Um, well, no one will ever find out because, as you know, Kyle, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, if we someone goes down there to take a course, they're not going to – we can't talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> not using this on Monday. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's such a good idea. <laughs> right. You didn't – I don't even have to put a non-disclosure agreement here. You just yeah. – by the nature of you being in Vegas, you know you can't talk about it. Can't talk about it. No, but I, I want people to talk about it. I want them. Right. <laughs> All right, Zach. Well, hey, we're going to call it there. Thank you so much for being on the show, and we will close out. Portal PT episode four. Take it easy, man. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time.